In 1604, the translators of the King James Bible found themselves with an unexpected dilemma. The church context they were writing for had a clear value for celibacy. Priests were discouraged from marriage and monasteries filled up with monks and nuns who dedicated their lives and their bodies to God. This dedication often meant fasting, self-inflicted pain, and especially the rejection of any sexual desire. And many of these practices continue to this day. This rejection, discipline, and punishment of the body can be traced to Gnostic and Platonic philosophy, though it is hard to find in the New Testament. Gnostic teachings often included the notion that the pure human spirit was trapped in an impure human body. The challenge of life was to become free of the physical chains and ascend as a perfected creature no longer tainted by the earth. Platonic thinking supported this perspective with its spiritual idealized form that could never be perfectly expressed in the physical world. Christianity inherited these perspectives and hid them deep within the Western way of thinking, especially in our words. Think for a minute about the word dirty and its meanings, its association with sex, with the earth, and with something that is disgusting or unwanted. And I want to digress for a moment and observe that the reason this paper is important is because a culture's sexual standards relate to how they treat the body and the earth from which it comes. The Christian context of the Bible translators was one in which religious people tried to reject the body along with its needs and desires as evil. In order to pursue a spiritual life, it was necessary to repress or pretend to overcome the physical life. Christianity is not alone in this assumption, but it has carried it to an extreme that influences much of modern thinking. Some theologians have even gone so far in their criticism of sexuality as to discourage sexual relations within marriage, assuming that all sexual desire could be attributed to the sin of lust. Not all theologians are like this, but you do have examples of this throughout church history. I, and in fact, I talk a little bit more about that in another part of my book, um, but here we're focused specifically on the question of sexuality in the New Testament. When a reader of the New Testament today looks in a Bible dictionary, they will see that pornea is often translated as fornication or fornication means sex outside of marriage. That was the English word chosen by the King James Bible translators in 1604 as the equivalent to the Greek word pornea. Fornication has a very specific meaning to English readers that was not the focus of the original text. In spite of its misalignment with the original meaning, the King James translation of pornea as fornication reflected the cultural norms and traditions of the time, making it difficult for them to use any other alternative word. Could their readers have understood the true meaning of the Greek word pornea? Was it better to choose a concept the reader would understand and could apply rather than one they may not find relevant? These are difficult questions to answer, and the King James translators decided to reinforce the Christian and cultural thinking of their time period that any sexual expression outside of a formally sanctioned marriage was a sin. This is just one example of how biblical and cultural perspectives can become so intertwined that readers of the New Testament may struggle to see the message it contains. <clears throat> even those with a scholarly orientation might struggle to unravel the rhetoric because it is even embedded in research tools like Strong's Concordance, a popular reference tool based on the King James Version that was written in the early 1900s to link English words to their translation of the original Greek words. Some modern translations of the Bible use the ambiguous English term sexual immorality instead of fornication because it reflects the more complex meaning of pornea to early New Testament readers. However, the footnotes of my evangelical study Bible agree with Strong's concordance that sexual immorality, the phrase, is just an updated way of saying fornication. There is still no explanation of pornea. Though now people think they know what sexual immorality means, because surface-level research points to fornication. Without rhetorical understanding of how language and meaning evolve, preachers will continue to use the New Testament writings about pornea to support any number of helpful or harmful moral positions on sexuality. In the next few paragraphs, I've applied my curiosity about language to unpack the meaning of pornea rhetorically through its use in the New Testament, linguistically through its Greek origins, and culturally through the Jewish heritage of the original readers. 
I've only outlined the problem in detail here to show how it can be hard to untangle a biblical understanding of sexual morality from its cultural context. In the days of the New Testament writers, pornea was a word with specific and rhetorical meaning. The specific meaning came from its roots in the Greek language and referred to prostitution. 2,000 years ago in Greece, prostitution was a respectable occupation for individuals who had no other economic recourse or who practiced prostitution in service of the gods. The word acquired a more negative connotation when it was applied to individuals who acted like prostitutes without needing the money or worshiping the gods. Their sexual expression was not in harmony with what people expected from the rest of their life, but grew from an excess of desire. Aristotle's ethics would have suggested to the Greek mind that such a person had never learned how to tame the inner dragon of their passion and allowed sex to rule their behavior in ways that may be unhealthy and perhaps harmful to themselves and others. Although the word retained its affiliation with prostitution, the connection was no longer positive. Rhetorically, pornea was used to describe a prostitution of one's body to one's sexual desire in ways that were culturally unacceptable, shameful, or immoral. An example of pornea provided by Greek dictionaries, though somehow absent from Bible dictionaries, shows how pornea could be used to discredit a legal defendant by showing that their expression of sexuality, whatever it might have been, revealed a weakness or flaw in their character. If the sexual desires of the body could overcome the will and intentions of the person, it was evidence that physical passions may overcome their social decorum and lead to other kinds of socially unwelcome behavior. In short, the initial reference to prostitution had become more broadly indicative of sexual acts that could be used to call the integrity of a person into question. The writers of the New Testament had access to many different words to describe a misuse of sexuality, but they chose almost exclusively to use the term pornea rather than directly referencing certain activities, like fornication. None of the New Testament authors directly say that premarital or extramarital sex, the meaning of fornication, is sinful. So it is clear that the English translator's choice of the word fornication was cultural rather than contextual. The New Testament writers use pornea with the same two meanings as the Greek culture. The term is applied to prostitution in which one's body is used in a way that does not align with one's being. The most obvious use of pornea was to discourage the Christian converts from their former practices of visiting temple prostitutes. For Christians in the New Testament, the act of sharing sexual intimacy with a temple prostitute would not have been in alignment with their identity as carriers of the promise. It would have appeared to be an act of adultery toward God, particularly to the monotheistic Jewish converts who saw food offered to idols, strangled meats, and temple sex rites as ways of worshiping another god. Because Christianity grew out of Judaism, it was important for non-Jewish converts to consider the meaning their actions would have to outside observers. One of the first uses of pornea in the New Testament was then the request that new Christians refrain from these three popular activities that might offend people familiar with the Jewish law and call into question their personal integrity as followers of the way. The authors of the New Testament also extended the rhetorical significance of the word pornea. A person who gave their life over to indulging in their sexual desires would have been accused of pornea and dishonored. Pornea did not only refer to sexual behaviors, but was used to give an example of physical desire overcoming one's sense of integrity. Again, that's all a repeat. For example, the writer of Hebrews described Esau's exchange of his birthright for a pot of stew using the word pornea. This man's stomach had become more important than his life. He was out of balance or out of integrity with himself when he let his physical appetites govern his behavior. He abandoned the promise of God for the sake of gratifying an overwhelming physical desire for food. At least this is how the writers interpret it. His actions were out of character, out of alignment, or out of integrity with his identity as one who carried the promise of God. This rationale echoes the Old Testament Mosaic prohibition of sexual connection or even marriage with people who are not of the Jewish bloodline. Even though there may be love and desire, a marriage between a Jew and a non-Jew would contradict and undermine the distinction that the nation of Israel was supposed to preserve between their way of life and that of the surrounding nations. In addition to violating one's own integrity, interracial marriage would have been a violation of the covenant the Jewish people had made with God. This thinking would have informed the theological understanding of all the New Testament writers, 
who came from a Jewish background and used the word pornea to describe any sexual behavior that might call into question the integrity of a person's commitment to God. In summary, the rhetoric of sexuality in the New Testament aligns closely with the rhetoric of sexuality in Greek culture, with some modifications informed by the Jewish roots of the Christian authors. It does not align with contemporary understanding of pornea as premarital sex or fornication. These mistranslations and misunderstandings come out of Christian tradition rather than the rhetoric of sexuality in the New Testament and cause several problems in the reading of the text and the religious practice of marriage and sexuality. Do I have time to show a few examples of clarification of pornea? Three minutes? I, I can't hear. Okay. Three, all right, I'll go ahead and do that. I have just a couple here with me. Um, okay. The clearest description of pornea provided by the New Testament authors comes from Paul in his letter to the Christians in the city, in the city of Thessalonica. Um, 2 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, namely, that you abstain from pornea. And then he describes what pornea might look like. He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust. This exactly reflects the Greek rhetorical meaning of pornea as the loss of one's integrity in the pursuit of passion. It does not imply the contemporary definition of pornea as fornication. 1 Corinthians 6 may perhaps be the most famous New Testament passage about sexuality. In the middle of his discussion of sexual immorality or pornea, Paul writes the following in verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And then he continues a little bit later, the body is not meant for pornea, but for the Lord. This passage loses most of its significance as a moral framework if the word pornea simply means fornication. Another example comes from Ephesians 5, which provides a contrast between moral behavior, which does not bring shame when it is publicly exposed, and immoral behavior, which people prefer to keep hidden. This provides an additional way of thinking about the implications of pornea on a personal level, which indicates that the need for secrecy is a potential sign of unethical sexual behavior. It also suggests that there may be some cultural influence on what kind of behaviors could cast a negative light on the integrity of a person. One last example comes from Galatians 5. Here Paul provides several examples of experiences that keep people from, from enjoying the blessing of life as a Christian. In addition to pornea, he lists about 15 other kinds of things like sensuality, sorcery, jealousy, fits of rage, drunkenness, and more none of which have the kind of specificity present in the word fornication. He concluded the section by saying, those who belong to Christ Jesus do not follow their passions and desires. You see the connection now. Um, one of the terms included in that list is sensuality. The Greek term is asogia, and it appears alongside sexual immorality, or pornea, throughout the New Testament to describe how some people live out of alignment with their integrity. Like pornea, asalgia means to live under the control of one's body and desires. So here we now have a related word supporting this understanding. Sensuality is the opposite of self-control, at least in, in, in this asalgia sense, and is an indicator that someone is not walking in the freedom of life in the spirit. The modern obsession with avoiding pain and discomfort at any cost provides a stellar example of sensuality and its ability to keep a person from building a beautiful life. Sensuality and sexual immorality often appear together in the New Testament as marks of people who are slaves to their passions and desires. Both terms have a similar implication. A person has followed the desires of their body and allowed them to rule their life. Once again, this paper here that you've heard today is part of a book that I'm writing on sex and spirituality from a Christian perspective. I'm curious if you have any feedback or questions on my use of rhetorical analysis here or on the clarity of my presentation to a non-academic audience. But thank you so much.